Hello, and welcome to an analysis of Poppies by Jane Weir. This video is part of our Power and Conflict series, and we'll be looking at the various themes and contexts of the poem, as well as where to find the best quotes for your essays. I'm going to divide everything we discuss into four different themes. Domesticity, control, faith, and voice. I'm also going to be using the following colours so that we can distinguish between each individual theme. So, before we start, I'm just going to give you a brief summary of the poem. I won't be reading it in full, so just make sure you've had a look at the poem in your own time before we continue with this video. The poem is told from a mother's point of view, and she spends most of the time reflecting on memories of her son before he went to war. We can see this poem as a kind of dramatic monologue, as the speaker is constantly talking to her son, but because he's fighting abroad, he never responds. She begins by noting that it is nearly Armistice Day, and goes on to recall how she corrected her son's clothing before he went to war. The mother wants to tell her son something, but she feels unable to speak, and before she knows it, he's gone. After his departure, her grief leads her to a churchyard, where she places her faith in God, to one day return her son home again. If you think about all of the other war poems in this collection, Poppy stands out because of how different its setting is. This is not a poem from the battlefield, but rather from a much more domestic setting. If we look at the context for a moment, we can see that Jane Weir had first-hand experience of conflict, as she had grown up in Northern Ireland during the 1980s. This was the height of the Troubles, and the IRA conflict wasn't in some far-off land, but on people's own doorsteps. Therefore, conflict is brought into the home, and we can see how it's not just the soldiers who are affected by it. For Jane Weir, suffering is a universal experience, and the mother becomes a kind of domestic warrior who must fight her own battles from home. The best example of this comes on line 18, when the mother proclaims, I was brave. Usually, we would associate bravery with the soldiers on the front line, but here, it is an attribute shared between all of those who must endure the effects of war. This elevates the mother into an almost heroic status, and conveys the domestic challenges which she must confront. What is most striking about domesticity is the language that Weir uses. Let's have a look at line 7, where the mother describes sellotape bandaged around my hand. On the one hand, the sellotape is a symbol of domestic life, and so it seems strange that Weir should couple it with bandaged. When taken together, the image of sellotape bandaged shows how military language has invaded the domestic space. No matter how hard the mother may try, these reminders of war have become an inescapable part of her life, so much so that they are present in even the most basic of things. Weir extends her military language throughout the poem, and we can see a similar example on line 29, with reinforcements of coat and scarf. Again, we would not typically associate coat and scarf with any kind of warfare, but by depicting them as reinforcements, we get a distinct military connotation. Once again, the presence of military language in domestic spaces conveys how ideas of war have begun to dominate the mother's mind and have become an inescapable reality of life. Control is an interesting theme in this poem because it isn't a constant. At the beginning of the poem, we see the mother in a position of control, but by the end, she has become powerless to influence her son's return and invests her faith in the power of God instead. In order to demonstrate this shift, we're going to look at Weir's extended metaphor of the seamstress. To truly understand this, it's important to look at the context of the poem and Weir's own occupation as a fashion designer. Not only is Weir a writer, but she also has experience in fabrics, so much so that she weaves in images of clothing throughout her poetry. She refers to this process as cross-dressing, as she frequently borrows the language of textiles and fashion 
for literary purposes. Let's have a look at lines 8 and 9, where the mother states, I rounded up as many cat hairs as I could, smooth down your shirt's collar. Here, the mother is in a position of control, and her power is exerted through the verbs rounded and smoothed. What is most interesting here is that she isn't so much controlling her son as she is controlling his clothing, like a seamstress who creates bespoke garments. Her power to influence the cat hairs and the shirt collar is clear to see, but by the end of this stanza, any sense of control begins to fall apart. This turning point comes on line 17, with the admission, all my words flattened, rolled, turned into felt, slowly melting. Suddenly, the mother has lost her command of language, and her sense of control begins to disappear entirely. We can see this in the enjambment between stanzas 2 and 3, and how this contrasts to the full stop which ended the first stanza. Also, notice the reference to felt, as the mother's words have morphed into this soft and malleable fabric. It's significant that she no longer has control over the fabric, but has actually become the very fabric itself, easily flattened and rolled. This continues on line 28, with the phrase, My stomach busy, making tucks, darts, pleats. These are all verbs which relate to the creation of clothing, but again, it is not the mother who is performing them. Instead, it is now the mother who is the subject of these verbs, as she has become the very fabric that she was once able to control. Weir's extended metaphor is concluded on line 33, with the image of the dove who pulled freely against the sky an ornamental stitch. As we are about to find out in the next theme, the dove is a religious symbol of hope, and the mother has submitted all of her power to it. Notice how it is now the dove who performs the role of the seamstress, creating a stitch in the sky. It's also important to recognise that this is just an ornamental stitch, and we may interpret this to mean that the mother never truly gets the closure that she seeks. Nevertheless, it is clear that by the end of the poem, she no longer possesses the control that she once did. Instead, she has invested herself in the divine and submitted to the forces of hope and prayer. Before we move on to a discussion of faith more broadly, I just want to discuss one final type of control. This time, let's focus on the son himself and how the mother describes him as he goes off to war. The mother notes how the world was overflowing like a treasure chest to her young son and that he was intoxicated by his commitment to the cause. If we're thinking about control, we may look at this word intoxicated and see how the son has become almost drunk with the idea of war, seeking to fight for his country without any kind of serious consideration. We might want to see the image of the treasure chest as a positive one, but it quickly becomes clear that ideas of war are more complex. The son may be driven by the rewards of patriotism, but the mother is more sceptical, depicting it as a mythical treasure which only belongs in stories. We may want to compare this to something like bayonet charge, and see the similarities between those who are motivated by false promises of glory and honour. Now, let's turn our attention to religion, as there are a variety of references to Christianity in this poem. If we stay on the sun for a moment, we can take a look at line 16 and the description of his gelled hair like black fawns. Although this may simply be a reference to the texture of his hair, we can't help but see an almost Christ-like element to this image. If we stay with this reading, we can argue that the sun going off to war has become a kind of sacrifice, akin to that of Jesus on the cross. Indeed, This does elevate the son to an almost divine status in the eyes of the mother, but it may also indicate his degree of suffering. If we go back to the mother, we can see how she turns to religion in her time of grief and desperation. From line 25 onwards, she describes how a single dove has led her to skirting the churchyard walls. Although we may want to see this as a kind of ghostly sight, 
I really want to focus on the dove as a symbol of Christian faith and hope. It's significant that the dove has led the mother in this way, as it acts as a kind of guiding force in her time of need. Ultimately, this dove leads the mother to the top of a hill where she finds a war memorial. She describes the memorial as a wishbone, and I think that this is a fantastic image to display her state of mind. On the one hand, she's fragile and weak, but on the other, she's wishful and has invested her faith into the single dove. It is this balance between hope and fragility which defines the end of the poem. Finally, I want to address the voices in this poem, or lack thereof. Poppies takes the form of a dramatic monologue, as we only ever hear the mother speaking. She is, of course, always talking to her son, but the dramatic monologue form actively prevents him from replying. This form isolates the mother and reflects the separation that she feels from her distant son. We never find out if the son is still alive or not, but we are left with the closing image of his playground voice, which the mother seeks to hear again. The tragedy of this poem is that we know the son will never reply, as the dramatic monologue form creates a kind of detachment which can never be recovered from. So, those are the main themes for poppies, and some of the key quotes and contexts that you can use in your essays. If you want to gain full access to all the videos in this series, then make sure to check out the Power and Conflict course at 88tuition.co.uk. Thanks for watching. See you next time.